the last plenary talk of the meeting by Susan Bates from uh, Columbia University, uh, who will tell us about a no, uh, novel, uh, no, it's the wrong talk, uh, CTCL and PTCL, and she's going to tell us what those things mean. That's right. <laughs> Epigenetic diseases, yeah. they yes. are. Epigenetic uh, therapies. So I will hold this up when you have five, five minutes five to go. Minutes okay. okay. That's good. All right. Uh, right. So I'm going to tell you not a lot about the diseases, but just about, uh, I, think, I think it's good that this talk came at the end because it sort of will help set everything that you all have been working in in context in medicine because it, it will show you how much we need to understand the basic science. Uh, that you're already working on when we go to use the drugs in patients in the clinic. Uh, so this is the uh, model, and what I'm going to be talking to you today about really is the histone modification uh, known as acetylation, and I know you all are very well aware of that, but we have the, uh, the nucleosome with the lysine-rich tail that uh, readily gets acetylated. And that's been the subject of a lot of drug development, that in addition to some DNA methylation uh, work that's gone on for uh, over a decade as well. So it's really a 10-year, a decade-long, more than a decade-long saga for me. The first time we had one of these drugs in our laboratory was actually in 1996 when I had um, this drug, when it wasn't a drug, it was a chemical compound, and we found it through a screen looking for uh, things that would be substrates for the p glycoprotein drug efflux pump. We took it in the lab. It looked really interesting. The NCI found it looked very interesting and was entered into phase one trials just because it looked unique. That was the whole reason for it. It had a nice structure that I'll show you in a minute. And soon along came others, and the mechanism of action was discovered shortly uh, to be inhibition of histone deacetylases. They were found... Uh, that all of these drugs that were eventually in development would bind histone deacetylases and prevent the removal of acetyl groups. And what, um, you know, in the most, y'all may laugh at my understanding of some of these things, so I'll just go right out there and say it, but uh, the acetyl groups neutralize the positive charge of lysine against DNA, which keeps the DNA tightly wrapped. And so you put the acetyl group on, that neutralizes that charge, loosens the DNA, and then you get gene transcription. And the genes that you get from that are genes that slow down or control cell growth or cause differentiation. So the HDACs themselves are overexpressed in a lot of cancers and then cause this <laughs> deacetylation, which makes these important genes not be turned, um, these important genes be turned off. So the deacetylation results in a stop signal. That's a good thing, but in cancer, a lot of times you get um, turning off of genes that you want to control cell growth. But a lot of people began studying these things in the laboratory and came up with a variety of mechanisms of action that they said, well, it's not just about changing gene expression. It's also that you put the cells in a rest and then they die or you actually, and we published this, that you, uh, the cell, the um, chromosomes don't actually hook onto the mitotic spindle as they should, and that causes a G2 arrest, and then the cells die. And that you get acetylation of proteins in the <laughs> cytoplasm that causes uh, loss of function of chaperones, and then a lot of proteins are degraded, and then the cells die or DNA damage occurs uh, because of loss of genes that control DNA repair. So many different mechanisms of action have been proposed. At one time I counted at least 13 different mechanisms. What well, didn't really matter because the drugs really worked. Here you can see a bunch of lesions on the bottom of a foot of a, actually a veteran who was in Vietnam, probably trudged through a lot of Agent Orange and maybe that is or isn't related to the fact that he got CTCL about 30 years later, but the drug really worked. Uh, this guy had a very long response of eight or nine months. One would like the responses to be even more durable, and sometimes they were. We've had one patient actually have a response for 10 years. Uh, this is another patient with a very good response. 
But when we collected all the data, we had two different studies. We started out with my study at the NCI, which was based on this uniqueness. Uh, then we found that there was activity in these T-cell lymphomas, and that was completely by serendipity. And then we found that about a third of patients had a very good response, that's overall response. So, um, and then the a drug company picked up the compound, identified the same thing, about a 30% response rate. And uh, the responses were durable, and this was enough for the FDA to go on and approve the drug. So cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is what this patient has. It's a really can be a very devastating disease, can be very mild, be very severe. But the HDAC inhibitor turns out to be a class effect for this disease and for reasons that we still don't understand. The second, is, uh, the second indication that we got through our same clinical trial was with peripheral T-cell lymphoma. Instead of the malignant T-cells being on the skin, they're actually in the lymph nodes. In the abdomen, in the chest, wherever they appear, they're in the lymph nodes. And again, the drug worked quite well in about 30% of patients and lasted a long time. So based on all the work that we did, plus work that was done by a drug company called Gloucester Pharmaceuticals, the FDA approved this uh, drug, Romidepsin, uh, for use in the clinic for these diseases. Those uh, approvals happened in 2007 and 2009, and so we've had them approved for a decade now, a decade now, and despite that, we still don't fully understand the mechanism of action or why they really work in T cells. And for a long time, I said, well, it doesn't really matter. It's going to be too hard to figure out, but with all the modern, you know, approaches, we've now started trying to tackle some of those questions. Um, and as I mentioned, it is a class effect, meaning other drugs do the same thing. So we now have four U.S. FDA approvals for varinostat, romidepsin, valinostat. Those are approved in either CTCL or the PTCL, either the skin version, the cutaneous version, or the peripheral version. Uh, in China, they've approved another drug that's not yet approved in the U.S., but may be eventually called chitamide and it uh, works on PTCL, and all of them look about the same. Now, what's really interesting is that we have this great drug that interferes with chromatin and all that we've talked about, and, um, but it hasn't worked very well at all in solid tumors. If you look at romidepsin, varinostat, response rates zero to eight percent. And so why that would be is still very much a mystery. We have much chromatin in solid tumors as we have in T cells. Uh, so these are some of the burning questions that we have despite a decade of drug approval. Why T cell malignancies? Why not solid tumors? What really is the mechanism of action? We had that dozen or so proposed. And then uh, what do they really do to chromatin? So we don't actually know the answer to any of these questions. Well, one hint in T-cell lymphoma and peripheral T-cell lymphoma came when the whole genome sequencing started to see that there were mutations in at least a subset, but by no means is this 30% of T-cell, of PTCLs, but a, a, a set of mutations that increase DNA methylation. And sometimes there are all three present in the same patient. Each of these columns is one patient and the red means is just highlighting all the TET2 mutations. TET is an enzyme that works to remove the methyl group from DNA. Uh, DNMT also uh, is involved in DNA methylation, and IDH2 uh, increases levels of uh, hydroxyglutarate, which is an oncometabolite that increases DNA methylation. But this is by no means in 30% of patients, but it is a hint that some of these T-cell lymphomas may be epigenetic diseases. So we wanted to think that this classical mechanism of action that I <laughs> described you would be the explanation, that we would increase the, um, increase the, open the chromatin and increase genes that cause cell cycle arrest, genes that cause differentiation, tumor suppressors, and that would be uh, a lovely mechanism to have, but there were a lot of things that sort of fly in the face of that. Uh, one is that 
you know, you would think if it's an epigenetic disease in 30% that those would be the only patients that have a, would have a response and then they would have a fabulous response. Well, I already told you the duration of response was around nine to 10 months. That doesn't really sound like a perfect targeted therapy. And then the second thing is that the responses are in a continuum. This is a waterfall plot. Each of these bars is a patient and this is how far shrink, how much shrinkage they have. And when you see a waterfall plot like that, that's a continuum, you begin to think, well, it's probably affecting all the patients to some extent. Some may be more sensitive, but you're not thinking that's a targeted therapy that's only good for a subset. And then when we took the patients, uh, we did gene expression profiling on the patients pre and post sample. What we found is that they typically the patients paired, their pre and post samples paired. It wasn't that we were in, we would be able to say, oh, all of these are disordered, all of these have differentiation gene expression. And then the next problem was that what we found when this is a heat map of gene expression and uh, green is low, red is high, is that at four hours, genes might be turned on, but by 24 hours, they're turned back off. Now, there were a set of genes that came on late, but by and large, the genes that went off came back on, and the genes that came on went back off by 24 hours. That doesn't sound like a very good cancer drug, actually, if it reverses that fast. And then the other problem you see here is that about half of the genes, in some studies, half, here it's not half, but um, the genes go down. So that's quite the opposite of the proposed mechanism of action of opening the chromatin. So if we open the chromatin, turn on genes, why do genes turn off? I've never seen anyone with an answer to that question. And then the next little bit of evidence, and that's the end of it, is that what we found when we took an array of cell lines into the laboratory, and we said, okay, we'll take sensitive cells and resistant cells, and we'll treat them all with romidepsin, and then we'll look at their histone acetylation and we profiled that, and so each of these little groups is a patient, and what you can see is that every patient gets histone acetylation documented, or every cell line here, every, and every patient when I've done it elsewise. So it, histone acetylation has no relationship with actual, with um, whether it worked or not. So that starts to be you know, a lot of evidence saying these things really aren't working by, um, by through uh, epigenetic mechanism. We did one last more recent series of studies trying to really get at that. We took three healthy donors, three patients with Cesare syndrome, treated them with uh, Romidepsin for six hours, equivalent to the clinical exposure, and did this in collaboration with a group at University of Copenhagen, and then did RNA-seq, cDNA array, and methylation analysis. And what we found here is that, um, again, it clusters by patient or by healthy donor and not really by treatment. You can knock out any um, patient-specific features and see an HDAC effect, but the first thing you see is no difference. Then when we compared CTCL and Cesare samples, we do see that there are, there is dysregulation of gene expression in the T cell category. So there's a lot of T cell genes that are very dysregulated. So we asked whether in the 436 genes that are twofold upregulated in CTCL versus healthy donor, do they go down with Romidepsin? And about half of those genes do go down. But again, we don't have a mechanism for why they go down. All we know is that we open chromatin. Then when we look at the genes that are downregulated, which is the hypothesis that we, oops, went the wrong way, downregulated. This is the hypothesis that we were working with, that too much acetylation, everything's downregulated, we're gonna turn that back on with Romidepsin. It didn't work very well at all. Only 61 genes really change out of that subset and only 38 of those go up. So only 10% of genes follow the paradigm that we've put out there. So, you know, what, what can we do at this point? Because we're really left with, um, you know, conundrum. 
Uh, and the methylation data is very preliminary, so I think I'm going to skip that for time. It was just to say, are we altering methylation? And what we can, all we found, actually this is the key slide in that, we did methylation analysis of the patients before and after Romidepsin, and what we found that only, a, this is a heat map where we have RNA-seq expression versus methylation percentage. And this is no romidepsin. And so you don't see, um, when you add romidepsin, when you treat with romidepsin, you don't see that these, that you have major decreases in methylation accompanied by major increases in RNA expression. There's a few genes that you can look at, but, so I think I've convinced you by now that, um, while we do see changes in T-cell signaling, and we do see that there is some reversion with bromidepsin, there's just a lot of pieces that don't fit with the classical chromatin explanation. So Tito and I love this uh, Willie Sutton rule that's used in medicine all the time where we say, well, you know, Willie Sutton was supposedly asked, why do you rob banks? And he supposedly answered, because that's where the money is. So that's what we do in medicine. We look for where the most common diagnosis might be. And so in this experiment, we'll go where the money is. The only minor detail about this that I just learned when I was pasting this guy's picture out is that he actually never said that. That's what the reporter thought he should have said. So what he really said was, because I love them. I love robbing banks. That's why I do it. So I thought, well, that fits too, because I love doing a good experiment and having it work out, so that does, uh, it does fit. But anyway, so then decided to go back to chromatin and the DNA damage idea. So what we did was took the NCI-60, the 60-cell line panel, exposed them all to six hours of drug, and then measured how many of them died after two days. That was the best we could get to sort of mirror the clinical, and it also gave us a nice spectrum of um, expression. We did it in a Nexon flipping <laughs> assay. Uh, so traditionally people do, and you'll see every time you see someone talking about HDEC inhibitors, you'll see 96 hour exposure, very low doses. It always works and does everything you want. It's not a, uh, it's not clinically relevant. But when you then take a, that, those killing curves and you make a profile on DNA of gene expression, a profile, uh, not gene expression, I'm sorry, a cell sensitivity profile, and you, and you probe the NCI drug screen database with that cell sensitivity profile, you get back other drugs that match this profile. And this is the list of drugs. They have nothing to do with histones, nothing to do with, uh, well, they do have to do with chromatin because they're all DNA damaging agents. So they're chromatin drugs, but they're not... Uh, HDEC inhibitors. And so we did, um, we did look and we said DNA damage, do we see DNA damage? People had already reported this, we're not the first to see this, but it comes lockstep. Gamma H2X staining comes lockstep with histone acetylation. So that was uh, one first idea. And then we began thinking, how could this damage occur? What would acetylation do to cause DNA damage. And so we read about uh, R loops, learned about it at a meeting, that form during normal transcription. And some of you probably know more than I do about this. But basically, while the chromatin is open and RNA is being transcribed, it will loop back and form an RNA-DNA hybrid. And I know there have been a lot of talks about loops this meeting, but I think this is a yet a different loop. So then this forms single-stranded DNA loops that are susceptible to all sorts of DNA damage, even in normal transcription. And normally, they're repaired very quickly by uh, several different things, including the Fanconi's anemia genes and BER. So different ways they're resolved. Um, and so we said, can we see evidence, could it be that romidepsin is causing acetylation, preventing repair of these R loops, or preventing closing back up of the, of the chromatin. And so here you can see that yes, so there's an antibody, S9.6, that's been developed 
to detect these RNA-DNA hybrids. And there's always a fair amount of background, and there may be other RNA-DNA hybrids. But the ones that have been studied are the ones that co-localize with nucleolin, which then this starts to look like the, um, the condensates that we've been talking about in this meeting. So here's co-localization of S9.6 with nucleolin, and there's a merge of that. And that's, um, we see a number of these throughout the, the cell population. There's sometimes several per cell and sometimes only, and then, but we do see nucleolin because that's in the nucleolus. So that's in the control, but you don't see the co-localization unless you add the S9.6. RNA-SH, which degrades that RNA-DNA hybrid, actually then you lose the co-localization. Another positive control is that it's known that FANC-D2 knockdown will also cause RNA-DNA hybrids to form, and we did that, and here you can see uh, the RNA-DNA hybrid and the co-localization. So we asked, uh, can we take a traditional assay and show that there is DNA damage? And here we took, we did the comet assay, uh, which is you take DNA, you uh, run it out, take the whole cell and run it out on, uh, on agarose in either alkaline or neutral conditions. And the alkaline conditions detect both single strand base pair breaks and double strand, I'm sorry, single strand breaks and double strand breaks. And so what we found was that in alkaline conditions, we do see with a dose response and also a time course, a steady increase in the alkaline condition detected comets. But, and you can see the comets, uh, I think you can see them out here. But in neutral conditions, we really didn't see them. And so that's the difference here and here. And then this is with two different cell lines, a CTCL cell line and a melanoma cell line. You can see a steady increase with the dose response in comments in the alkaline conditions, <coughs> meaning that when you compare this to this, that the difference is due to single strand breaks. So this made us think we really could be making these R loops and the single strand breaks. So then we said, how would that be repaired? And so uh, there's multiple mechanisms of DNA repair. Krastan talked yesterday about uh, the nucleotide excision repair. So we thought, reading through them all and thinking about it, that the most likely one would be base excision repair. It's been reported to be involved in resolving our loops anyway. Uh, several different proteins are known to be involved in base excision repair. Uh, it, it's the da it repairs damage caused, for example, by oxidation. Uh, and then there was the idea that HDAC inhibitors induce oxidative lesions. So it made sense. So we went to look and see whether any of the base excision repair um, proteins could be detected co-localizing with the R-loops. And indeed, we were able to found, find XRCC, as you can see here, and the co-localization here. And then um, pole, B, uh, pole beta, which is uh, known to also be involved in repair of, of uh, the single strand breaks. And you can see that co-localizing here. And then um, this is PARP1, also known to be involved. So there, you can see those two little co-localized ones. So, in all, we have demonstrated that these proteins known to be involved in the BER pathway and in involved in our loops uh, re resolution can be detected in our cells after romidepsin. You know, it's still, I'm still bothered by the fact that we just have one or two big aggregates and not tons of little speckles, but I uh, have to think that that may have to do with the sensitivity of the assay. Uh, so then this is just a schematic that goes through that. We open the chromatin, we form R loops that makes them more susceptible to damage, and then that can be repaired, and if they're not repaired, the cell dies. If they are repaired, the cells become drug resistant. And one thing that may help in this matter is that a lot of DNA repair, these are, these are two different experiments. This is one experiment, and then this is a blow-up of, 
uh, some of these, but these are just a variety of DNA repair proteins. I think Yves Pommier came up with 276 DNA repair proteins, and a large portion of them are downregulated by, um, by Romy Depson. So that also doesn't <laughs> help, the fact that you turn off. So that uh, leads us back to our original question, and the conclusion of that part is that Romy Depson HDAC inhibitors in general induce DNA damage, that that's most likely single-stranded damage through acetylation-mediated persistence of R loops and downregulation of repair proteins. So back to the question, DNA damage versus epigenetic regulation, I have to think that it's probably both. And so uh, back to the, back to where we started, I think there is clearly a dominant DNA damage signature. That's what we see in our cell line experiments. But the, um, the fundamental epigenetic regulation is also real. And that's where we are now. So if anyone uh, wants to collaborate on this project, I would be delighted to have collaborators. We've talked with Stoino about uh, using his model system to really look at this and I, I think it's gonna you think you can solve this problem for us maybe so I have a lot of people that worked on this over the years and that's um, <coughs> our new lab is much smaller than our old lab but and we're hard at work on these problems so that's it thank you so while, other, while you're all thinking of your questions, I can ask my first one. Does this give you any additional insight into why T-cell lymphomas as opposed to anything else, any solid tumors? That, you know, because that's one of the questions you started with. I know. Um, not really. Not really. I still don't understand why it hasn't worked in solid tumors. I don't understand that at all. Uh, it would have to be that they are just more primed for apoptosis if you turn off the genes that they're relying on. But then that is an epigenetic explanation and not a DNA damage explanation. So you can... Uh, crush that. Yeah, so I, I've always wondered why, if you can open selectively the chromatin only to those cancer cells, why don't you use uh, genotoxic drugs uh, during those 24 hours? So you do. I mean, when you combine... So what is the effect when you when combine? When you combine HDAC inhibitors, with genotoxic drugs, with platinum, with you get synergy. It's very easy to demonstrate. And I see colleagues doing these experiments all the time. They typically will do the whole 72 hours. That opens a chromatin better than anything else. And then adding uh, the HDAC inhibitor, I mean, then adding the platinum or the topotecan agent, you get great synergy. But it didn't work in the clinic so far. Now, why is that? That, that's been the primary strategy that's been taken for solid tumors. But we're not giving up on it. It may just be that we needed to select the solid tumors that don't have DNA repair profiles that are intact. So that's our next idea, is to not do just every patient that comes, but do the patients, do the patients who have DNA repair defects in their tumors. Um, so I just had like some thoughts while you were talking and, you know, I don't know what this hypothesis came out of nowhere, but so you say you open up. That's my favorite kind of <laughs> hypothesis. So you open up more chromatin and you see transcript, uh, you see re uh, gene expression go down. <laughs> Could it just be that you are diluting the transcriptional machinery and things are going down, therefore yeah. you have like slowed down transcription, yeah. longer persistence of R loop. That's probably the, the leading hypothesis was, or the only hypothesis I've really seen out there was that you're sucking out the, um, to the enhancers, the transcription factors that are needed for all the other genes and then they go down. But I never really saw that proven as the explanation. I kind of have thought that why, well, I, until this meeting, I thought that transcription factories were a more stable thing. So I was envisioning that the chromatin gets stuck in the transcription condensate, and then there's no condensate left for the other genes, and then they go down. 
So that's sort of, I'd love to prove that. That, that might be real. But that's the only idea I have. I think that it's a beautiful talk, and I think the hypothesis is an interesting one, but there's lots of other things that are going at the same time. What I'm curious is the following. You say you open the chromatin, and then you try to go. So what happens to the things that the, with the cells that build resistance? What happens if you do the same proof? Why they don't open? What, what happens to them? Um, you know, that's not been systematically worked out. That's not been systematically worked because out. Because the mechanism there, is as general as you talked yeah. about. There's no, then you shouldn't, in principle, if you open it, you could open anywhere and you would take right. all this stuff out and then there would right. be enough, right? We don't know why it doesn't work in solid tumors. I mean, we did develop a series of resistant cell lines and what they mainly did was alter the apoptotic threshold totally, like they so couldn't they, undergo apoptosis. And once we reversed that, then they did. So they were still getting it. So, um, so this they, would say that if you have lots of DNA repair factors available, you would be resistant. Or you somehow, you're not opening their chromatin as much as before. There's some, right. as, I don't know, there's some change there that... Uh, well, we did see in patients that there did seem to be a threshold. You have to have enough acetylation to last long enough. But if you give everybody the same level of acetylation, then they... They should all have the same amount of killing, and they don't. I think it's downstream. Thank you for the really cool talk. I, I might have a stupid question, um, so forgive me if, if, if I'm just missing something obvious. But the um, it that seems to be like the first step of this picture that you have. What's going on is that chromatin is being opened up, but um, and, and you have like a picture of like closed heterochromatin, presumably. Um, and my thought is that. Is it possible that it need not be like heterochromatic in your, is it is necessarily heterochromatic regions in your mind that are being opened up or is it possible that just existing euchromatin with nucleosomes on it, those nucleosomes are becoming less tightly wound, making it easier for RNAP to pass through those yeah. already existing open regions? So that's never, I've never seen a paper describing whether it was densely repressed genes versus um, more normally expressed that are more euchromatin or poised, which is what I tend to think is what's being turned off. But that was one of the experiments we were trying to do in the T cells, and we didn't see very much correspondence between, you know, half the genes were turned off, but the, only a fraction were demethylated. So that suggests that it's not heterochromatin. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very yeah. much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Creston, do you want to say something now? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, next talk is by Peter Littlewood. Where is, where is Peter?